So let's start off by, let's talk about cultural competence, such a relevant and important conversation for uh, all of us. So here are the things that I have prepared to share with you and to invite the discussion. First, before we are able to talk about what is cultural competence, I only thought it's befitting to define what is culture. Then we're going to talk about cultural competence, cultural sensitivity, and multiculturalism. We're going to cover uh, cultural humility, what are the cultural norms and values, cultural adaptation, teach culture versus coconut culture, working with, with recent immigrants, and as you know, considering what's going on currently in, uh, in Ukraine, how many people are potentially traveling and we truly are becoming a norm, a nomad society, and some of the cultural variability to consider. This is just coming from DSM-5, Cultural Concept of Distress. And I will share with you a real life cautionary tale, what happens when two cultures collide and how much collateral damage inadvertently we are able to impart in people's life without having that cultural sensitivity and awareness. So let's start off by, uh, if you're comfortable taking off yourself off mic, or perhaps you can also type in in the chat box, what does cultural competence mean to you? The first thought, perhaps, or maybe your own experiences. When you, what do you think of when you think of cultural competence? Just having a general understanding of other people's backgrounds, what they believe in, what they um, what they do at home, because even though their culture may be one thing, their culture at home may be a different one. So just understanding them where they are and meeting them at, at wherever they may be. So if that's, you know, that they do certain holidays or they do certain things, they don't eat certain things, just being aware of it so that you're not offensive in any way. I believe it's- uh, I love aware. that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead, Jesus. Yeah, I believe this, uh, be aware of others, people aware of um, cultural um, backgrounds and acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very, very important both points that Vasti and Jesus had done. Thank you. And I'm getting a lot of uh, chat definitions and participation, which I love. Being sensitive to differences, being aware of your own imperative, being able to appreciate habits, culture, and the multifaceted realms. That, that makes us another uh, belief and custom, being aware of your own culture and openness in general understanding. Love all the participation. I think understanding, also in, appreciating. Yes, Tommy? I'm sorry. I think also being, being able to interpret other cultures uh, accurately. Yes, very important. Thank you for, for adding that. I think it's also um, I think it's also being willing to do the footwork when you don't know, <laughs> being willing to say, OK, I, I got to do I have to do some uh, little research here. And I think staying humble, most important, just stay humble about your knowledge set, your your skills with that particular culture and like others have said, really keep an open mind. And if you're unsure, yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. And if you're unsure, don't be afraid to ask questions. Very good point, Virginia. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Putting yourself in culture shoes. Don't assume that you know. We have a pretty good understanding uh, what it means and the importance of taking different aspects of it and how dynamic it is. And most importantly, having humility and having understanding of your own experiences and perhaps being aware of your own blind spot and biases that we inherently have just being human. So let's define it first. And I did wanted to share with you that um, I found it really, really, I'm a wordsmith and I love definition of the words. And I wanted to understand for myself, having to learn English as an adult, I really uh, realized the complexity and how much language is actually teaching us if you just pay attention. And I don't think this is going to be a surprise to you that most English words that have 
uh, etymology in Greek or Latin origin. So if you look up the meaning of the word culture or the cultus in Latin, it basically means to care. And when we care, that basically is encompasses everything that we need to know about what does that really mean to have a cultural component to our clients that we show up and we care because being in this profession by definition means that we have a caring personality. But I found it really interesting that it's also applicable, and this is the foundational of the word, what is culture really mean? So if you look at the uh, definition from the American Psychological Association, culture is defined as the distinctive customs, beliefs, values, knowledge, art, and language of a society or a community. And these values and concepts are passed down from one generation to the next. And they are the, basically the basics for everyday behavior and practices. If you look at DSM-5, and specifically how does DSM-5 define culture, it gives us a little bit of a broader understanding to kind of make an emphasis, which is very, very important, that cultures are multiple and have multiple facets. The DSM-5 definition of culture states that culture refers to systems of knowledge, concept, rules, and practices that are learned and transmitted across generations. Culture includes language, religion, spirituality, family structure, life cycle stages, ceremonial rituals and custom, as well as moral and legal systems. Cultures are open dynamic systems that undergo continuous change over time. And in a contemporary world, most individuals and groups are exposed to multiple cultures, which are used to fashion their own identities and make sense of experiences. So this is um, more of an understanding because we do, in order to be a really great clinician, we have to, it is our ethical responsibility, regardless of your licensure status, to be aware of cultural implication before we ever diagnose our client because we do have the greatest potential of inflicting of pain by implying there is, there is a psychopathology when it's explainable culturally. So now that we have an understanding how complex and multi-layered culture is, I think it's only fitting to talk about how do you define cultural competence? So according to American Psychological Association, cultural com competence is defined as the capacity to function effectively in cultural settings other than your own. This usually involves the recognition of the diversity between and within cultures, the capacity for cultural self-assessment and the willingness to adapt personal behavior and practices. Cultural competence has become a central concept in healthcare with education, educators and practitioners focus on recognizing the cultural variations in clients' health-related beliefs and activities in order to improve cross-cultural communication in, in health outcomes. APA basically defines it as the awareness and appreciation of values, norms, and beliefs characteristic of a cultural, ethnic, racial, and other groups that is not well owned, accompanied by willingness to adapt one's behavior accordingly. If you think about the hallmark of health, whether it's physical health or whether it's mental health, it truly is a concept of being flexible. People that are rigid and people that have rigid thinking are typically the ones that are struggling and having the most clinical impairment and emotional distress. So being willing and being able to adapt is basically a reminder to us how flexible we need to be. Uh, I also wanted to point out that our society, just like DSM-5 had pointed out, is very pluralistic. In addition to the dominant culture, oftentimes there are a number of other cultures that you will find that coexist at the same time. And these multiple aspects of identity will absolutely influence our worldview, including sexual orientation, gender, age, disability, education, religious, spiritual orientation. And they're both specific and very culture-specific uh, phenomenon that we have to be aware of and take into account. So everybody across the board, when you talk about the culture, the instinctual um, understanding or the first thought that comes to mind, typically we think of somebody's uh, ethnical, ethnic background or race. But I do wanted to point out how 
extensive and multi-layered component of culture truly is. So I wanted to make certain to remind all of us that it is about generation and age, country of origin, educational level attained, family or household composition, sexual orientation, language of the dialect, perception of family and community, perception beliefs about diet and nutrition, political beliefs, religious and spiritual characteristics, socioeconomic status, cognitive ability or possible limitations, degree of acculturation, environment and surroundings, gender identity, health practices, military affiliation or occupational groups, perceptions of health and well-being, physical ability or possible limitations, racial and ethnic groups, and residential uh, status, whether somebody is living in the metropolitan urban area, suburban area, or rural area, and occupational status. I always, um, in my own experience working with clients and being aware of my own experiences, I've always considered any unique life experiences that are representative of subculture because the experiences that we have in life inadvertently that does put us in a class of people that had shared the same experiences with us. So if somebody had been a single parent, if somebody um, is struggling perhaps with growing up in the family that you have a special need sibling, all of that provides an opportunity for you to participate and experience things that would not inadvertently be so obvious to people that haven't had those experiences in life. I do find it really interesting, like I said, I'm a big wordsmith and the word humanity and humility kind of has the same, the only difference is two letters in between. So it's a great reminder for us that what makes truly us humbled human is that we have to have a concept of humility and that goes incredibly important when we're working and providing services for um, the clients that we have been privileged to work with. So I wanted to give you a separation or division for you to be aware that there is there are two uh, areas or two buckets. So there is a cultural competency which is a developmental process in which one achieves increased level of awareness and we continue to grow, we continue to educate ourselves and we continue to learn. We need to combat, but you can't combat anything you're not aware of. So you have to be really aware of your own stereotype biases or perhaps blind spots, gaining experiences about learning about different cultures, understanding about your own identities, where you have grown up and now where, where dominant culture is, but then the second component of it, I almost think of it as two bookends, the cultural humility. And the cultural humility, the essential component of it is really a reflective process where you step back and you truly start to look and examine your own privileges, your own biases, recognizing that you, it's not possible for you to know it all. The element of acquisitiveness, very, very important to invite other people to share what's important to them, what they value and how you're able to view the world through their own eyes. How are you able to learn from other people willing to share and educate you, uh, you in essence, what it's like to live in their own individual culture. How do you really become a culturally competent clinician? You know, there is an argument to be made uh, a couple of years ago National Association of Social Workers had updated code of ethics. And the argument was made is that it's truly really not possible for us to be culturally competent because there are so many different cultures that it would be impossible for us to ever attain it. So I think that when you think of competence, perhaps a better fitting term would be to be culturally aware. Because when you're culturally aware, it means that I'm not claiming that I have all the answers. And most importantly, I'm able to see the human being with all of their unique life experiences, with all of their challenges. And I'm able to really truly understand that it is a mosaic that we are all comprised. And this is how we become to be who we are. So how do you become a culturally aware or culturally competent therapist? 
first and foremost, having an open attitude, having an ability to stand back and say, I am willing to explore and I'm truly able to participate wholeheartedly without having any preconceived notion. Then after you have an ability to be open, you have to have a capacity to be self-aware. You can only take your clients as far as you're willing to go yourself. So this is where the component of self-awareness comes in. Asking the client, asking open-ended questions, and having clients tell and share their stories, what they have learned about themselves in the process. Then that way you're able to truly become aware of other people because people will inadvertently share, but they will also share depending upon their own experiences in life, how much shame or separation or denial of them who they are as human beings. And then after you're able to be open, after you're able to have your own ability to self-reflect and have self-awareness, then you can start paying attention what other people are sharing and what are they doing. Then you can gain some cultural knowledge and that will foster your ability to truly cultivate cultural skills. I really, really loved um, what C.S. Lewis had said. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Humility, having a sense that one's own knowledge is limited as to what truly is another culture. And um, entertaining hypotheses rather than drawing conclusions. It is very, very stereotypical. And I'll be honest with you, I included perhaps it's very stereotypical, but I have to tell you. I included that because this is what I had experienced. I moved here when I was 18. I did not speak any English whatsoever. So there had been some challenges with everybody was learning their craft. I had to learn English first. And when I would share with people that I was a former Soviet, the second question that most everybody had asked me whether I liked vodka. And initially, I thought it was funny, but at some point, I recognized how many biases inherently we all have. And people always judge what we don't understand. And sometimes people want to include or engage with you. And they think that this is a level of engagement. At least they're claiming that they know something about your culture. So the cultural humility, humility, how do you say things that actually matter? So this is an example. Oh, you're Japanese? You might love sushi. When I thought about, when I saw this image, and it inadvertently took me back. It's not happening as often anymore, but I can tell you, there hadn't been a week in my life when people would not make, attempt to make a connection and make a comment, oh, you might love vodka. So the proper way of having humility, of having inquisitiveness is, oh, you're Japanese. How do you feel about sushi? Not that we would necessarily talk about sushi, but this is just an example of how do you present the conversation from a hypothetical standpoint. So what are the cultural norms and values? And I think this is perhaps one of the biggest um, blind spots that I wanted you to uh, be aware of. So first and foremost, concept of time and time limits. Um, a real true story. My husband has a daughter-in-law, and she is from Ethiopia. And uh, the family has always kind of made a little joke of how she's never on time, ever on time. And the family is, to some extent, it almost seems as if she doesn't have a lot of interest of showing up for family events. Well, here's the challenge. In Egypt and a lot of countries in South Africa, Time is a suggestion. So when you grow up with the concept that it is a suggested concept, no wonder people do not show up in life on time when you expect them to show up. So when somebody is making an appointment with you and they don't show up at the schedule appointment, they might be really, really confused as to why you would not be able to actually see them because for them, time is a suggestion individual values as opposed to group values. This kind of really was highlighted quite a bit um, why some parts of the world 
we're more so much more compliant with wearing masks as opposed to individual values that we oftentimes experience in the Western world. Valuing conflict as opposed to harmony. If you think about Buddhism and the premise of change, a lot of times, and people always kind of sometimes are insisting on knowing, and it doesn't really have to be necessarily adversarial, but oftentimes people want to be seen. Physical space and proximity. Sometimes um, certain culture, it would not be okay for you. For example, in Norwegian culture, if there is a big bench and there are three people, the third person is never going to be able to sit down between two people because that is not acceptable approximation for the uh, Norwegian culture. But if you go and let's say you're in Spain, people have absolutely no problem being next to each other. Communication and language, including body language. Uh, when I was young, I actually used to dance. And the first country that I was able to visit as a, as a teenager with my dancing company, with my dance company, was Bulgaria. And to be honest with you, I, I was in shock because in Bulgaria, in Bulgarian culture, when you say no, you say no. And when you say yes, you say yes. So imagine how confusing it is if you have no idea of such a stark differences in, in body language. Sometimes people will tell on themselves without even knowing, but there are substantial differences of how we communicate. Eye contact, as you know, there are some cultures for you to have a direct eye contact would be incredibly not polite. It would be rude because it would seem confrontational. But it's easy to draw conclusion that people are perhaps are concealing what's going on for them. So once again, is it customary? We oftentimes work with clients that are Native American. It is um, the eye contact is really, really different. Uh, it's a different concept. Touching. The concept of touching is also uh, very, very different according to which cultures you come from. Some cultures will uh, absolutely will extend the hugs to you. But for another culture, for example, if you are of Muslim background it is not, or of religious Jewish background, it is not okay for a male to touch a woman under no circumstances. Health believe in practices. Um, once again, cultural norms, the most common one, probably something that we all have heard and seen. If you grow up in the Jehovah Witness culture, blood transfusion is not a possibility that you will entertain because this is against your belief and health practices will actually be very, very different. Attitudes and belief about authority, control, and um, even necessity, oops, sorry, even necessity um, for you to acknowledge uh, the role of faith, where you have an ability to kind of go along with whatever the divine intervention is has in store for you. Gender roles. If you think about some of the most common gender roles that come into play, historically speaking, um, not to generalize, but it is very important for you to consider that. There are some cultures that are very patriarchal. And um, I recently came back from a visit to a Fiji, and I've learned so much about the culture. And what I've learned is that um, families typically continue to have children until they have a son. Why? Because when the son gets married, the wife actually has to move in. Otherwise, um, they don't have an ability to keep their land. The focus and majority of women, by the way, are uh, their role. They prefer to stay at home. If you think about Japanese culture, oftentimes when, when the family has a child, a lot of females, it is customary for them to stay at home until the child goes to school. And then a lot of women will consider going to work part-time. Focus on relationship, family, and friends. Uh, sometimes it is not uncommon to give you an example. If you're in Spain and if you are at the big party, it would be very rude of you to leave the party without going around and uh, shaking hands for men and hugging women because this is what the custom is about. But if you are in um, Norwegia or Finland and if you go around the party, 
saying goodbye to people, that would actually be considered rude because you're basically interrupting the flow. Religious and spiritual factors, a lot, as you understand, and your own experiences have been of how sometimes structured um, some of the religious or spiritual components might be. Somebody who is spiritual, and I can't wait in the end of, uh, of the presentation today to share a real life story, and it's probably one of the most inspirational books. And also, also a sense of politeness. It is a very, very much culturally defined concept. What is polite in one culture can very easily be construed and experienced as being rude. So once again, learning and having an open mind about what is truly culture and what do we true, what do we make of this? Does anybody have other input in terms of your own experiences or perhaps things that you haven't considered before? that I'm bringing as far as cultural norms and values, some of the things that you kind of knew that they were there, but haven't given it much thought or perhaps haven't seen it in your current clinical practice. I think the concept of Anybody time wants? was really helpful that you, that you shared um, because if you think people are being rude if they don't show up on time, if they arrive late, you can miss something that would be valuable in the communication because you're so focused on that um, signifier of respect when in fact, for someone else, it was a suggestion, it, it wasn't taken. And, and I think that happens a lot with online meetings too, to a lesser extent. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, absolutely. Uh, Monique says too much change and kind of an intrusive about LGBTQA, how the world gate is not acceptable, for instance. I, I do think that we've made a lot of progress in LA area, but unfortunately it's not the it, um, it's not the experience of uh, for a lot of parts of the world, even in America. So I think being aware of it and having people come in and kind of share with you what that does that mean? How does that show up in their life and what's important and relevant to them? At the end of the day, everybody wants to be seen. And I think we do a great disservice by um, having uh, categories and we think of culture. It is a culture, but at the same time, every individual is part of the subculture. And I think it's very important for us to be aware of it. If you're aware, you can slow down. Uh, Trisha, absolutely mental health in its own culture with various subcultures. Could not agree more. And if you uh, have ever worked with individuals that struggle with bipolar one as opposed to bipolar two, that really, really uh, emphasizes is that bipolar, not all, all bipolar is, is seen or treated in the same way. Um, so mental illness and mental challenges are also a subculture in its own. So let's... Um, have a little bit more of a discussion. There are two questions and feel free to pick or perhaps you wanna cover both. What actions or rituals make a behavioral and mental health professional culturally competent? And what have you seen, how have you seen cultural incompetence displayed in your, either in your own life or in your clinical practice? I think with the, the current political uh, divisions that we're going through, it has been so challenging. Um, you know, because you're a healthy, uh, a, a healthcare provider. And, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school for my doctorate, I never got, <laughs> we, we didn't talk about this because it wasn't, it wasn't happening, but the divide's so great now that mask or no mask, vaccine or no, you know, you have to be mm -hmm. so careful. And it's the, the, the potential for offending is, is really high right now, really high. So, so that, you know, trying to relax, breathe, be curious um, is, is, the most important thing. I, I started teaching graduate school because I heard so many stories from clients about 
the, the cultural incompetence of their clinicians. And it's one of the things I really focus on with my students. Um, you know, I, I'm in the Bay Area, so, uh, you know, it, it's, we have such a great, rich uh, availability of cultures and people, and I, I'm so grateful for that. Um, if I can do one thing in the course of a week to ease some of that stress or tension with my clients, I, I've had a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that. And I really appreciate the fact. And I, I actually did the conversation today that I graduated in 2002. Um, with my first master's degree. And I can tell you, we didn't really, I don't recall having any, we had a cultural class. We needed to learn about different cultures, but we didn't really, I don't remember ever emphasis on cultural competency. It's almost like it wasn't a concept that we were aware of. And now, like you said, with so many abrupt changes and with so many, with such a political device, I think it is important for us to start having conversations about this because if we don't, we're basically perpetuating status quo and status quo tends to be not acceptable because we are a very dynamic society and we live in very interesting times and we need to be kind to one another. And I think having that awareness is the key. Like you said, if you make a difference or you, you provide somebody with some information that you shed light, you really do create the impact. Natalie, um, one more thing though that I think around this, this line of thinking, I'd love to get other people's uh, thoughts and your thoughts on it, is that there, because of the politics in, in our lives right now, it feels to me like there are parts of our country that are saying this extreme right-wing way of being and, and, and looking and thinking and, and acting is a culture in and of itself. And that it, it warrants, I've not heard this directly, but that it warrants our consideration in the same way that we would, we would try to apply that competence and consideration and thoughtfulness to matters of race or sexual orientation, age. Somebody mentioned, um, you know, homeless, uh, homeless populations, all, all of this, but they're, I've gotten the sense that they're claiming this as a culture. Do, do you know what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm explaining this yes. right, but it, it's like, yes, ah. yes, you do. Elizabeth, I agree. This is, um, I'm sorry, did I cut somebody off? I'm sorry. Okay, um, I, I agree. And I think that the challenge for all of us is to um, have tolerance for anybody who mm -hmm. is different than myself, who has a different social political perspective, um, posture, ideology, the, I think for, for me personally, the challenge is how do I give audience to a perspective that part of that ideology is a disregard and disrespect for who I am and right. how I show up. That, that's the piece <laughs> that, you know, and, and I... I am a, a JDEI, a Justice, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion leader here at, at, at my organization. And so I'm saying everybody matters, your opinions, because we're all human. Right. Uh, and I can give space for that. I have to figure out how do I give space for ideologies that part of that ideology is hate or disregard against me or my fellow human. And that's the piece that I think takes being culturally competent to a whole nother level. It does. That I, that I can say, you know, yeah. I, 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 you know I, I recognize that you don't like me or you don't, you, you feel a certain way about um, 
black people or women because then I, I intersect with both of those. But where can I meet you? Where can I meet you? Because that's the goal. If I can right. meet you in a common as a in a common denominator, which may be we're all here to serve the, the patients and families here as mental health professionals. If I can meet you there. So I think that's what it takes. You know, I have to breathe sometimes. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I have to breathe because, you know, I'm having an audience with people who just, oh. you know, you just show up and you, you just show up and I just don't like you just because. Yeah. But you're still a human. And I still mm -hmm. have to appreciate and be tolerant of who you are um, and have a, create a space where we can talk about that. I think that's so great, Mitzi. And I, I really, really, I, I am so in agreement with you. It, and, you know, just that self-check with consultation, went, because the thing that I've witnessed over the last couple of years is how families are getting ripped apart. And I've got, my, I've got clients coming in and their hearts are breaking. And, uh, you know, this is, this, it, I loved what you said about it takes it to a whole different level. Different level. You know, it takes the yeah. whole idea. And, um, you know, Natalie, I don't, I think it's fair to say we're, there's a lot of us that are out here struggling. You know, we are because, you know, it's the cumulative effect. Um, you know, I'm a woman, I'm a senior, and I'm also uh, a lesbian. And so I, I've got like a trifecta of hate possibilities. So, you know, it's like, whoa, you know, it's, 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 it's really hard today. It's hard today to see people. It is. And I really, really, really appreciate both Elizabeth and Mitzi and Marilyn and uh, Carrie participation and kind of sharing point of view and Emily. I think it's important for us to start showing up. What I always say, if you don't heal, you will continue to bleed on people that did not cut you. And I think this is a really important point is that we have to know how do we really start healing and how do we start acknowledging and not lashing out at people? Because change is hard. And I always loved what Mark Twain said. The only person that loves change is a wet baby. But it's against the natural laws, change is inevitable. So I think it's important for us to kind of embrace it and perhaps to be tolerant of that change and to be tolerant of the fact that we, did, we didn't know better that we do now. So let's meet somewhere in, in, in a trajectory of possibility. Let's meet in the, in the field of openness where we have enough tolerance to just listen to each other and to hear each other out and to be seen as humans because that is the human race. Is that what makes us different from any other mammals? We do have a lot of the same needs for safety, security, but we also have a need to be loved. And I think that also comes from a perspective of how do I really start healing some of the challenges that I've been exposed to as a child and uh, the cultural or the people that were so ignorant that they've made comments comments about us, so they marginalize us in some aspects. Natalie, I have a, a, a comment. Um, certainly. Uh, I just wanted to be mindful of white privilege and how that plays into this kind of conversation, you know, as a gay, you know, Irish born in Britain, kind of uh, mixed multicultural human being here in Los Angeles. I'm always aware that, but I'm also white and that, that coming into the room comes into the room before me almost. And no matter who comes into the room, I have to be very mindful of the impact of that. And the other thing I'd like to say is, I find this really interesting in terms of trauma and how working as a trauma specialist, working with people from different cultures, how, how trauma is perceived and interpreted or you know, uh, in different cultures and the impact of that uh, in my work has been huge. And for example, you know, in one culture, maybe you know, smacking a child in a certain way is acceptable, whereas in another, it's not, of course, it's not in any, but uh, there's so many different, you know, uh, uh, rituals and traditions and uh, behaviors that are so different and just being aware of, of them two things. Thank you. Such an important, uh, and I really appreciate your, your input and most importantly, understanding how trauma is normalized or even perceived and how that will impact all of us. Very, very 
all very relevant and important uh, consideration for us to keep in mind. I really appreciate it, uh, Dr. O'Malley. So let's talk about some of the, for the mindfulness of the time. We're actually scheduled to go until 12 o'clock, so I only have you for the next 17 minutes or so. Cultural adaptation. I really wanted to emphasize to you, and this is not a concept that I came up with, but I thought it was very prudent and relevant for us to think about it. Are we coming from the peach culture or from the coconut culture? And what is the essence of each culture? So for example, if you are from a peach culture with majority of what you find from Western society, peach, peach culture is focused on individual with priority on truth or the right way. Teachers are very easy to get to know, but there is a limit to what they're willing to do for a friend. There are a lot of rules that apply to everyone equally. Time follows an agenda. Life is compartmentalized. I never can pronounce that word. Compartmentalized. And one's place in society is based on achievement. Coconut cultures. Coconut cultures focus on relationships. Loyalty to the group is the priority and the basis for security and trust. One does not get through the outer shell easily, but once you're inside, lifelong friends go through the great length for one another. Rules, times, and boundaries all blend in the service of relationships. So think about it. Oftentimes, when you are a peach, it's very, very easy for you to be open and to be friendly and to start conversation with strangers. But there is a limit because the core of you it stays pretty hidden as opposed to the coconut culture. So how do we mesh? How do we actually bridge those relationships? How do we build trust and positive relationship when we are hierarchically, historically, generationally are so different? So with peaches, a coconut can start with friendliness, being sincere, appreciative, smile, let them talk and explain feelings and the impact. With coconuts, on the other hand, peaches can prepare more, give facts, be logical, be brief, give time to think, and don't take criticism personally. This is even more impactful when you actually start to work with couples and you will realize that even though they come from the same ideology, they come from the same background, how often these clashes are actually likely to cultures, these cultures will clash. So the cultural dimensions, whether it's emotional versus neutral, specific versus diffuse, how although on individualism will really come into play. I wanted to also give you a perspective. At some point, you all are likely to encounter individuals that are recent immigrants. Anytime you move into a different country, there are typically three ways that you can relate to someone else's culture that you're trying to make your own home. You either confront, you complain, or you conform. And when you listen to people, when you listen to their story and their importance and what's relevant, it actually comes to light. When you confront, you actually believe in your system that your behavior is the only way to do this because your behavior are the right behavior. And I think it really comes from a position of safety where you are insistent on being right as opposed to being loved because love is a concept that perhaps is foreign to you. When you complain, inevitably you will isolate yourself into social bubbles of foreigners and you're going to have a difficult time integrating and you inadvertently live in segregation from society that you found, you're trying to build a home to. When you conform, you really adapt to the way of behaving you conform to the whole society and you truly benefit from uh, assimilation. You benefit from diversity when you are learning to observe, understand the behavior of other people. And you try to adapt to make certain that your way, you don't have to really try to forego your own identity, but you adapt it based on the majority of the culture where you're now finding yourself to be in the home. We do have um, a really great tool that a lot of clinicians are not even aware that that's a resource. And I wanted to point out if, if it happens to be that you did not have a chance to look through it. DSM-5 in the back of the book, it has a cultural formulation interview and it has an ability for you to start 
formulating questions in a way where you get to know your clients from a position that uh, they will be able to share the story, not who they are, but what, for example, what is the definition of the problem in their culture? How are the people that they are living with, how they are conceptualizing and how, do, how much of an issue do they see it? So there are several really helpful cultural formulation interviews, including the informant version that you will, uh, you will be able to find at the end of DSM-5. We do um, have professional guidelines regarding of your professional licensure, whether you're a clinical psychologist, you are a licensed clinical professional counselor, licensed marriage and family therapist, or a clinic, licensed clinical social worker. We do have guidelines that basically remind us that our understanding and practice of multicultural competencies, meaning that it's not just the person that we're seeing, but there is a subculture inherent within a culture that we have to be aware of. And it is our ethical responsibility to continue to learn, to continue to grow, be flexible, and coming from a position of curiosity. So our clients have an ability to share their story and to be seen. Cultural variability to consider. This is, a, 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 this is a form that's called cultural diversity matrix. And this is actually something that had been put together by Department of Health and Human Services for us to really understand, not just in terms of our primary language and religion, but also who is the decision maker in the family? How do you really do the introduction and how formal do they have to be? You look at the gestures and the health behavior and beliefs. Once again, I think it's a very helpful reference point. Once again, not to assume anything, but it kind of gives you a template of understanding how does the culture in general grow up? What is the immersion that you had been exposed to growing up and where you're coming from? And also, the older we are, the more um, that we are in our traits. And I think it's because we've had more practices and as you know, a lot of our behavior becomes automated. So taking that into consideration and holding that, I think it's gonna be very helpful for us to just keep, keep in mind and being aware. Uh, also at the back of DSM-5, there is a cultural concept of distress. If you haven't had an ability or the desire, or even perhaps some did not know, DSM-5 was very uh, inclusive of some of the cultural differences that we need to be aware of. And it only has, I believe, four or five pages. And um, it talks about from different cultures, what is susto, what is that syndrome, what is attacking the nervous, what's nervous, uh, nervous. It's very helpful if you work with diverse population or you work in metropolitan, big metropolitan cities like Elizabeth was saying. Um, when I teach um, cultural competence, I always have uh, my students, uh, because I teach uh, a lot at Pepperdine Graduate School of Psychology, I, I make certain that, uh, just like Elizabeth has a passion of making certain that we're providing that sensitivity element so early on, that everybody is aware, what does that look like and how different is that? And um, I'd like to conclude today by telling you, if you've never had a chance to read this book, it is a book that recently has been widely assigned to as a, as a mandatory reading for medical doctors, for journalism, for anthropologists, for mental health professionals, among very many other different professions. And the name of the book is The Spirit Catches You As You Fall Down. Um, it is an ethnography about a uh, Hanam uh, family that immigrated to the uh, Merced, which is in Northern California after uh, Vietnam War 1979. To give you a little bit of information about, uh, this is probably one of the most impactful books that you can read, that cultural, lack of cultural awareness and to a certain extent ignorance, how much our experiences are essential for us to take into consideration. To give you, uh, if you don't know where Hmong culture is, it's um, Southeast Asia, where the China and Vietnam, that part of the world. And um, so this family immigrates to the um, United States. And uh, they are says she had to read it in, in school. Uh, very pleasantly surprised. So they are, since you read it, maybe you can put in the chat box whether this you will endorse my um, 
recommendation of reading this book. To make a long story short, this is a family that had uh, 15 children. And uh, when their first daughter was born in the United States, she was the fifth in birth order. And uh, when she was three months of age, her sister came from school and she slammed the door. And uh, she was born with good Abgar score. There was no consideration, no challenges. And shortly after the door slamming, Leah started having seizures. And her parents, being of that culture, have concluded that the soul, the spirit, had left her body. In American culture, in medical terms, you would actually consider that to be a medical diagnosis because it's a seizure disorder. It's an epilepsy. And initially, they included um, healers such as shamans. And if you think you, everybody know who a shaman is, but in the traditional sense, shaman is somebody that reunites spirit with your body. And when they actually had taken her to a medical doctor in the hospital, the doctor misdiagnosed her with pneumonia. And Leah continued to have new multiple seizures. And the doctors had um, basically given her medication. But the problem was is that Hmong culture never knew. They don't live by the clocks like you and I did. They live by moon and the sun. So unfortunately, um, and they were illiterate, they could not read in English, they could not read in, in Hmong, and they used their children for translation because we didn't have translators. Unfortunately, what happened is Leah was removed from her home by Department of Child Family Services because it was considered to be medical neglect. Um, the mother and the father were so um, incredibly... Um, engaged and involved with Leah, that they uh, got close to the foster mother. And the foster mother very soon realized that they were the most caring two parents and the lack of education and understanding of doses of management. And, uh, and also another component of culture is that when something like this happens to you, it is considered that you are possibly one of the chosen ones. So potentially that could lead to your greatness and where you perhaps the superpower of being the shaman in the future. Um, unfortunately, um, despite the fact that the foster mother had really worked tardlessly on, 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 and the mother, the biological parents eventually got Leah back. At, she kept on having dozens and hundreds of seizures and at four and a half years of age she had a catastrophic seizure and she was uh, declared uh, dead uh, brain dead and doctors anticipated that she could die within a couple of days and uh, they basically had allowed her to move in home so she could spend time with her family her parents were so very dedicated and uh, it was it's, it's uncommon for somebody to survive past four or five years when somebody has been found to be in vegetative state so this catastrophic seizure happened when Leah was four and a half. And through this love and dedication and care of these two incredible parents, Leah actually was able to celebrate her 30th birthday. They exercised with her. They bathed her. Um, this is a really, really important um, humility lesson for all of us and how it's easy to jump to conclusions and to not include people's experiences and uh, the spirituality aspect and lack of education and inability and to to credit of the foster parent who really had been able to turn all of this around and social workers tirelessly work on educating them about the clock and the dosing. It's a very, um, it's a cautionary tale that I think it's important for all of us uh, to, to, um, to know at least it's a real life story and Diara says absolutely very enlightening. Hopefully that will kind of help you um, understand the importance of once again, staying curious up and open-minded. And um, in closing today, I do wanted to tell you um, two things that really kind of resonated with me the most. The key to understanding others is to first to understand yourself, because if you understand yourself, you will be able to not allow your blind spots to kind of percolate and to take over. And um, in closing, we all have cultural lenses, whatever that individual and unique life experiences that we have. And it truly is, is not what we see, 
it is about what we perceive. And I think that's the lesson for all of us to be culturally aware, to be culturally competent. We have to be open and we have to stay curious and we have to understand ourselves because you can't give away what you don't have. And um, in closing, I just wanted to tell all of you guys that on Friday, uh, you will receive an email with uh, an ability to watch the recording again. And for um, those of you that would like to have a class on continuing education so you would be able to receive CE units, you can look within the same email. You're going to have an opportunity to get 20% off. And the code to receive the 20% off is Let's Talk. And all of this is going to be shared in the email that you're going to receive uh, this Friday with an ability once again to subscribe, um, to in, enroll into the continued education opportunity on cultural competency and get 20% off. And also, if you choose to, you can uh, watch and participate once again. And the slides will also be included in that email. And with that said, it's been a great honor and a privilege to spend the last hour with you. I really, really, Dr. Thomas Amani, Elizabeth, Mitzi, um, and um, a couple of you uh, that Kelsey and Monique and Carrie, I really just thank you for all of your contribution. And most importantly, I really want to thank you for uh, having an interest to spend the hour and kind of peek and understand what is cultural competence, what is culture, and what is important and relevant in our lives. And um, I'm at the top of my hour. And Kelsey, I'd like to ask you if you have anything else to, to add. Thank you, Natalie, for the great presentation and for everyone attending. Um, today was great, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you. Bye. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much. Excellent presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>